Hello people, I'm Tommy, and in a world full of theft, terrorism, and tax evasion, sometimes I just need to rest my brain and play something simple. So now, it's time to take a look at and explore a puzzle collection that we in the West were refused. The Nintendo Puzzle Collection, a group of Nintendo's most enjoyable puzzle games, and Yoshi's Cookie. Released in Japan on February 7th, 2003, this game was advertised a decent amount west side, as it was planning to get a release here. However, we never did get this game. Did it sell poorly? Or was it just an overall bad game? Let's take a look. Let's just insert the game and- oh wait! That's right! This system is region locked, which means I cannot play it on my North American GameCube. You know what that means? The devil has claimed my soul. So in reality, I do own a Japanese GameCube. Problem is, my capture card decided to not want to work, so emulation is my way of capturing footage, so we can just toss this out. And if I'm reported to the authorities for it, here is concrete proof of me playing Nintendo Puzzle Challenge on original hardware. Anyway, let's get on with the game. You start off with the home screen, where you choose between three different puzzle games. And if you have the Game Boy Advance to Link Cable, you can play other versions of the three. They're just simplified versions of their original SNES or NES ports. Not much to see here. Anywho, let's start with you. Yoshi's Cookie, saving the worst for first. Yoshi's Cookie is a return to the 1992 puzzle game on the NES and Game Boy, where cookies come down and you have to match them. You either move a row of cookies horizontally or vertically in order to clear the screen and move forward. This can maybe be fun. I've played quite a few puzzle games in my day, and Yoshi's Cookie is certainly not one that ranks high. The single player just doesn't have a lot going on to make the game exciting. However, there is a remedy to this. All games in the Nintendo Puzzle Collection went in on having the three games included have a story mode and a versus mode against bots, as well as having a multiplayer for up to four people to play at once. In terms of Yoshi's Cookies versus mode, it is quite different to its single player counterpart, and by that I mean it is actually fun. Now you're given 5x5 five five rows of cookies, where you have to match five of the same cookie the fastest, while throwing status effects at other players. This is a major step up and far superior to the single player version. It's typically a 1v1 in the story mode, while the versus mode lets you fight up to four people, and there's no limit to the characters, so if you want to see three Bowsers go at it on the battlefield, you can tell Smash Bros to go f*** itself because we got Yoshi's cookie out here. And in terms of the story, since I can't read Japanese, what I gathered was Mario and Yoshi make cookies, Bowser tries to steal them while they're asleep, and now we need to fight with cookies to get the other cookies back. And that's my interpretation, so you know it's right. In the end, the biggest flaw with Yoshi's Cookie was the lack of variety. It has a single player that need I remind you is quite poor, while having a versus mode against people or bots. There's not much else to say here, so although it's probably the best version of Yoshi's Cookie, that ain't saying much. Unlike Yoshi's Cookie, which was a remake of the original game, Dr. Mario and the Nintendo Puzzle Collection is just simply a port of Dr. Mario 64 from the Nintendo 64. The first mode is the standard Dr. Mario we all know and love, drop the pills and destroy the viruses. Despite its simplicity, I love this version of Dr. Mario. It can get really hectic at points if you miss drop a pill, which can happen because I am bad at Dr. Mario. But what about the story? In this game, you have the choice between playing as Dr. Mario or Wario. And starting off, Mario has a magic pill bottle that is supposed to cure people of all known ailments, and this guy right here steals the pill bottle, and Wario chases him, and then Dr. Mario and Wario fight? Once again, this is my version, so it's definitely correct. Anyway, this introduces us into the versus mode for Dr. Mario, and this is where I take a stance. Now, I said with Yoshi's Cookie that I preferred the multiplayer over its single player. In the case of Dr. Mario, that opinion is reversed. I really could not get into the multiplayer. It doesn't have that competitive oomph that makes versus modes in puzzle games fun. It's just who will clear their board or fill up the pill bottle first. Now, this isn't the only way to play Dr. Mario, you've got this mode where your goal is to instead destroy the glowing viruses before your opponent. 
it's all right. It definitely changes the way you'd go about playing Dr. Mario, and it's probably my favorite mode here. Other modes include the timed mode by getting as many points as possible, and the four player versus mode, my god. Now you've got the option to play with teams or a free for all, and it's okay, but doesn't interest me for long. Dr. Mario was a pretty good time, the single player is classic, and I'm sure if I got people together I would have a lot more fun with the versus mode. There's a decent amount of variety here to keep the game fresh, and it is definitely a step up from Yoshi's Cookie, even if it is just a port of a Nintendo 64 game. Now we've seen a puzzle game that was pretty underwhelming, a puzzle gaming classic with a fairly mediocre multiplayer, and now it's time to talk about the best puzzle game ever made, Panel Day Pawn. I absolutely adored the original Panel Day Pawn, released here as Tetris Attack on the Super Nintendo, and developed by Intelligent Systems, known today for developing Save to the Series over here. The origins of this game date back to the Nintendo 64, where the game was originally titled Panel Day Pond 64. The game was eventually reworked as a GameCube title and placed in this collection, and you can tell because that 3D model just oozes N64 era. And this version of Panel Day Pawn is a full-blown sequel to the original on the Super Famicom. So this collection contains a remake, a port, and a sequel game. Talk about a variety. But now it's time to get into the content with this game, and I'm not just saying this as a huge Panel Day Pond fan, but this is easily the best game here, just based on content alone. So many modes, you got the single player, the multiplayer, and tons of variations on the Panel Day Pond concept. I talked about how I preferred the versus mode in Yoshi's Cookie, and how I preferred the single player in Dr. Mario. In Panel Day Pond's case, it is all top notch. The basics of the game is that you've got these colored shape tiles, and you have to match three of a kind, keeping them at the bottom as they ever inch closer and faster to the top. However, if you match four or more, you're rewarded with time freezing, and the more panels put together at once, the more time frozen. As tiles disappear, you have the opportunity to set up another group of tiles, leading to a times two, a times three, and so on, racking up massive points and freeze time, and that's just talking about the single player. If you bring these strategies to the versus mode, you can drop junk onto your opponent. And if a group of panels are popped right next to the junk, it turns the junk into panels. Typically, large amounts of junk pieces can lead to large combos, keeping the game super fun and competitive. This game succeeds in flying colors as both a casual and competitive game, but there is still tons more content than that. One of the biggest features included is the 3D mode, where you're scrolling around a cylinder shape as panels go up. This mode originated in the game Pokemon Puzzle League, which is just Panel Day Pawn with a Pokemon skin. Which, very interestingly, is a first-party Nintendo title that Japan never got. Now you know how we feel. Never given us dosh in the giant eat shit, Nintendo. Other modes include clearing rows past a specific line, a puzzle mode which sometimes makes me feel like a genius and other times make me realize I'm a disappointment to the Panel Day Pawn gods. Additionally is the four player versus mode, and this is amazing. This is the first and only way to play Panel Day Pawn with four people, and this is such a fun mode. It's chaotic, but still manageable. If you can get three people to want to play Panel Day Pawn with you, which is an achievement in and of itself, it can make for such a fun time. You got a large roster of characters, like the main character, Furl, who is the descendant of the Super Famicom's main character, Lip. Yes, these are separate characters. Lip has the flower, Furl has the amulet. Speaking of characters, this gets us to the final mode of the game, the story mode. Now, the original story of Panel Day Pawn was quite simple, so let's see how this one goes. The story starts with Furl being happy, living life to the fullest. However, that all changes one day when the upper class gets too big for their britches and destroy the land Furl once knew as home. Losing everything causes Furl to snap. She's had enough of the oppressive regime she lives under. Blissful ignorance is no longer tolerated. It is time to dismantle the Foundation. Furl journeys across the land, 
gaining the support of the masses with the idea of the working man being the one in control. She frees a lion from his serfdom, where it transforms into his true form, a boy by the name of Cain, who assists in Furl's revolution. As she pushes onward, her group becomes an army, and they begin a ruthless purge of anyone against the revolution. As they inch ever closer to the castle, those who are in support of the current government are massacred indiscriminately. Men are cut to pieces, women trying to protect their children are killed right in front of them, and not even the children of anti-revolutionaries are spared. Furl then pushes the masses of her army to the capital, where they are killed in the dozens. The blood stains of her closest friends and was heinous foes matter little to her. The death of one man is a tragedy. The death of millions is a statistic. They make it to the monarch's palace, and he and his family are brutally put to rest in an instant. Just as Furl approaches the throne room and takes her place as the leader of the people, a divine angel sent from the heavens appear to destroy Furl's bloodlust. But it was too late. Even the power of God was unable to destroy the flower fairy of destruction. The angel is destroyed, symbolizing that the people need no god, no religion to follow, a world where one's destiny is carved by man, and not in the hands of a divine being. But yet one still remains. The whale. The large creature was a last resort to end Furl once and for all, but just like the gods above, was far too late. As Furl and Cain defeat the creature, Furl chooses to spare its life, and instead of killing it, they brainwash it bend its mind to serve them and them alone, showing that nature itself has kneeled to Furl's new order. And by the end of it all, Furl and Cain stare off, seeing a new world created. However, after this moment of bliss together, Cain himself would grow wary of Furl's increased ruthlessness, even with all opposition destroyed. He began to conspire a coup d'etat against Furl's new government. Unfortunately for Kane, he would be exposed, and all memory of Kane's contribution to Furl's new order would be wiped, and he was forced into exile. Years later, he would be found dead, killed by an ice pick to the back of the skull. And so ends the story of the revolution, and the end credits play of the supreme leader, running on the rainbow. She had gotten what she wanted. No gods or kings. Only Furl. I hope somebody can verify that for me, but I'm almost certain that's what the characters were talking about. It's a shame we never got this game. Three puzzle games and some of the best of the best in their respective franchises. But playing this game has rejuvenated me, so it's time to go outside and get some fresh air. The world is a cruel place.